Hello YouTube and welcome to episodes 7 and 8 in the Monogatari series, that being back in Monogatari episodes 7 and 8. Yeah, we're looking to wrap up the arc today. Well, today's a bit of a weird word because you'll see in this recording session it's going to be split over two days. So <laughs> I've run into a bit of trouble and my normal recording day got tossed around a little bit. So, so I'm going to record this one here on the Thursday and then the next one will be recorded at some point either tomorrow or over the weekend. So I'm recording very early for a video that's going to be uploaded like next Monday. <laughs> so it's a little bit weird, but I wanted to get two out this week just to finish up the arc. Uh, just, yeah, thanks again for the support on the latest video. I thought it was amazing. I'm very happy with it. I was very happy with the support on the last video as well, the four and five. People just keep watching it. And I'm very happy about it. So thank you very much. Lots of likes too. Get the likes up. I like that. This one's not really as a thank you, but just in general, uh, I have a little bit of time on a Tuesday now that I'm going to try to turn into a slot maybe, but it's not going to be an analysis heavy show, if you know what I mean. I'm going to be on the lookout and probably have a poll out maybe next week looking for a comedy or slice of life show, something to that effect, something a little less serious, a little less analysis heavy, and something that I can probably record and edit on the same day if that makes any sense so it'll be an extra video a week which is always fun but yeah just something a little more low-key can be long i don't mind if it's a long show but uh but yeah uh, recommendations in the comments would be appreciated uh speaking of the comments we're gonna go have a look at the comments now let me just bring them up all right got the first comment here by frequent commenter niku fukin i'm very happy with that uh, there's about four to seven eps per arc in the future. How are you going to handle it? Great question. I honestly have no idea, and it's going to be up to you guys to tell me good stopping points even within that arc. So obviously, if it's a seven-episode arc, I'm not going to do one episode and then six in a row. But what I'll probably do is do maybe one episode, then three sets of two, something like that. Or maybe... Yeah, whatever I feel like, really. <laughs> I'll do two episodes when I can, because I really do enjoy uh, getting through it a little bit quicker. Makes it a bit bit more of a meaty episode, which is always nice. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Just know that whenever I'm within two episodes of the end of an arc, I'm going to be doing two episodes. The next comment here is from uh, Harry Coda... Codetinks? Codetinks, I want to say. Harry Codetinks. I honestly have no idea how to say that name. But uh, he's, his comment reads, Also, please don't feel like you need to catch everything. Monogatari is overflowing with foreshadowing and extra meaning. I feel people usually attempt to dump all the missed meaning here in the comments, and I don't think you should try to understand even half of it at this point. I'd like to selfishly urge people not to tell you everything. To me, a lot of the enjoyment came from realizing what past scenes meant for the big picture of the story. Cheers. Uh, I've been honestly kind of feeling the same way. So in that way, I'm going to stop trying to get it all in one go, if you know what I mean. I'm just going to try to let it happen a little bit more. Be a little less predictive and a little more in the moment. I think that'll make for a better video and a more entertaining video for you guys. Because I've watched reaction videos before. The, uh, the appeal of it is, I know what's going to happen. That person doesn't. I get to watch what they think when thing happens. So if you already know when thing happens, half the meaning is gone, then... Well, not gone, but you already know it, then it makes it a worse reaction. I completely understand that, and I'll try to avoid that kind of stuff in the future. But yeah, thanks for the comment, Harry. I'm not going to attempt that last name again. I've got the next comment here by MDW. I'm really enjoying discussion at the beginning. Please keep it up, and do you have an upload schedule? I do, but it's in Australian time, so it's a bit wonky. On a Tuesday at 1 a.m. generally, but I have been stuffing up the last couple of weeks, uh, will be Monogatari, and on Friday morning at 1am 1, 1 is a uh, is a Land of the Lustrous reaction at this moment. I'm about halfway through Land of the Lustrous at the moment, and would be looking for a replacement soon. Well, soonish in the grand scheme of things, but yeah, so again, keep the suggestions coming, I'll have probably a poll out in the next couple weeks. Oh, and I've missed Harry's first comment here, I'm not going to do that last name again. Uh, yay, new upload, I'm really excited. Your videos are really well done. Uh, did you have a reaction channel before this? It feels like you've been doing this for a long time. Not at all. <laughs> I've been lucky enough to have people listen to me talk about uh, my stupid opinions on anime on Discord for a while. Just, you know, good friends and that kind of thing when we're watching it over Discord. But 
nothing like this and I'm really blown away by the support. I'm glad you like the videos and I'm going to keep them up. So thank you. <laughs> uh, Alexander Dunkelheit's back with another comment. Uh, he quotes a uh, part of the episode. Well, I guess it was more like I forced him to let me help. I think that is said in more of a playful manner. You could see this as her father also being a big sundere when it comes to this kind of stuff. He was just hesitant to have a daughter helping with his work. It isn't it supposed to be anything dramatic. So yeah, I kind of, I'm kind of trying to force the the father bad theory, which I I don't think I probably should as much, but uh, that's probably maybe what they're meaning by don't be too predictive and that kind of thing. So maybe that was. Hmm. I struggle to call it a translation error. Uh, it's more just a misinterpretation on my part of the gravitas of the conversation, if that makes any sense. But yeah, thank, thanks for the heads up. I like that kind of comment because it's not too spoilery. It's just an understanding thing. So you're not revealing anything. You're just kind of making sure I'm not going down the big wrong path. <laughs> he continues with the whole upperclassman crush thing of the subs not being a very effective decision for the translation. I would have used admiration, which I think other subs get right. You'll see what I mean. It's not very spoiler. Yeah, okay. So, again, maybe I was trying to force like a weird romantic thing between Kambaru and Senjogahara. I think I'll leave that to the rest of the fandom. I'm pretty sure they have that covered. Um, but yeah, thanks for the comment, Alexander, again. I'm, I always enjoy your comments. Continuing the theme of iffy translation, we have Silverbard here. Uh, there's some iffy translation here, and that is often the case with series, considering the dense dialogue and the wordplay of Nisio Isin. In the subtitle, Senjo Gahara says she was Kambaro's crush. A better translation would be that Kambaro idolized Senjo Gahara as she simply doesn't imply any romantic attraction in the original Japanese. Again, yeah, that was probably a, a bit of a strange translation, along with me being a bit of a moron. I mean, you could probably pick that up. As far as planning out stopping points, all the arcs are labelled going forward, the only exception being Koyomi, Koyomi Monogatari? Yeah, Koyomi Monogatari, which is a series of standalone shorts and doesn't contain arcs. The larger question then is what's the watch order of each arc? I'm a fan of sticking with the original release order, others will advocate for watching the order of the novels. The only difference here is that you will notice is the changing in the viewing of the Kizumonogatari movies, and yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm probably doing Kizumonogatari next because I have a, I've had a lot of requests for novel order, more than the broadcast order. But honestly, the way you explain it in the comment it doesn't really seem to matter too much. Uh, Venomous comes with a reply to that said comment. There's quite a bit of iffy translation beyond that, just in this episode and the rest of Bucket. There are a lot of times when they completely flip the meaning of sentences or imply things that the original didn't. Some of these are pretty major mistakes. Unfortunately, there isn't really a good fix for this because Bucket in particular doesn't have a great translation available. Cold Girls is probably the best alternative, but they have their own issues. The rest of the series is generally better about it at least. Uh, I think I'm switching to Cold Girls after this, after Bucky Monogatari. So we'll we'll see. We'll try to compare and contrast the errors there. But again, I don't know Japanese, so I guess it's like if you don't know that something's wrong, then you will never know. If you know what I mean. The problem's only there if you notice it. If you're Japanese and you're like, this isn't how it's supposed to go. But anyway, I'm I'm sure it's not that big of an issue. People have always a bit strange about subbing. I've never had a huge problem with any sub track. Just, yeah, you just got to understand that it's a different language and got to take it with a grain of salt, whatever it says on screen. And Venom Moose's original comment, he links a part in the episode and he says uh, he's referring to Kambaro and Senjo Kahara's past friendship, I'm sure. Even if it's unwelcome gift, he would like them to get along again instead of being apart due to something that happened when Senjo Kahara wasn't really herself. That's uh, that's the part where it's like the still frame and uh, Araragi's talking, just speaking out loud. I think he's speaking with Hanakawa or speaking his own internal voice. I think it's that part. Also, about the part of Senjo Gahara's family situation, I guess nobody corrected you when you missed this in the first arc, but Senjo says she's living in a small apartment together with her father now. Thank you for the clarification. Because I've never seen him in there. Just, I guess he's just working. He continues, they're in a ton of debt and they had to sell the house due to her mother's involvement with the cult. So while he was working a well-paying job, they're definitely not well off anymore in that way. Okay, so he's kind of paying off the debt and they've got a worse house in the meantime while he's paying off that debt. 
And yeah, that's all the comments for now. If there's any comments that come in overnight, I'll try to cover them at the start of the next episode or, or that kind of thing. But but you'll see. You will see what happens. But yeah, thanks again for all the comments. I was, I was very happy to read them all. There was some interesting stuff there about translation and, and, and what's the correct interpretation of stuff and that kind of thing. But also a comment of maybe just leave it leave it be for now. Maybe don't be too... Maybe don't be too hell-bent on understanding everything on a first viewing. So I think I'll take a little bit of both perspectives going forward. Now I've got a little bit of a recap going into what happened last episode. Araragi is followed on his way to a study session with Senju Gahara whilst talking with Hachikuji. He is interrupted by a girl named Kambaru Saruga. She seems kind of like a sporty, uh, kind of kohai type character. And we're going to find more about her up next in this episode and later in the episode I'm recapping now. Kambaru seems to know some stuff about Senjo Gahara. She seems interested in Senjo Gahara and Araragi's involvement with Senjo Gahara. She kind of makes, like, kind of, I don't know, what idle chit-chat in the meantime until the topic is brought up. Araragi has a study session, kind of, <laughs> with Senjo Gahara. Uh, they talk about a bunch of stuff, including their future and other stuff, and there's a pen goes in somebody's eye and blah, 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 blah. The subject of the chat then changes to Kambaro Suruga, and Senjo Gahara reveals that there's some history between her and Kambaro. Senjo Gahara explains that Kambaro used to idolize her, where we've got that correction now, other than upperclassman crush, which is a little more of a romantic implication. Uh, that Kambaro knew about Senjo Gahara's weight thing back in the day, and that they had some kind of falling out, potentially involving some scissors. <laughs> Araragi then calls Hanakawa on the subject, to which she reveals some more information, i.e. that they were the Valhalla duo, and that they were good at sports, and that kind of thing. They, they were definitely close back in the day. Hanakawa also seems a bit weird about Senjo Gahara and Araragi's relationship, and we're going to need to follow that going forward, especially when her glasses kind of glaze over. Araragi crosses some train tracks and is attacked by a beast that is, in all likelihood, Kambaru Suruga. I'm pretty sure that the implication is that it is. We can deduce this using the bandage on her left hand, the hair kind of in one shot, and also meta knowledge. Like, there's a problem with each of these girls in each arc that needs to be solved that's kind of supernatural, and this is hers. It makes sense. Uh, just some predictions for the next episode going forward. I think there'll be some kind of Sentra Gahara Kambaru confrontation. I think we'll get some kind of communication with Oshino Meme, whether that's through phone call or he deems it serious enough for a personal visit. Uh, maybe some Shinobu? Maybe? They've, they, it's been a while since she's been in the show. Well, not that she was really in the show to begin with, but you know what I mean. Uh, I think there'll be some increased Hanakawa involvement, or maybe that's just me wishful thinking, because I think Hanakawa is downright fascinating and I want her to be in the show more. Uh, and honestly, I don't really know what else to expect, and that's cool too. I'm just going to kind of let it happen. And just before we get into the episode, just some shill stuff. If you like the video, please consider liking the video. If you like the video and want to see more, uh, consider subscribing. And I'm taking comments with new show suggestions and that kind of thing, as well as, you know, anything about the, this episode or previous episodes or anything about my presentation or anything else you want me to change. I'm very happy to do so. But yeah, let's get into the episode. I'm on a little bit limited time, so we're just going to jump right in. Cool, and we're back. I got the episode up and ready to go. This is episode 7 and Saruga Monkey Part 2. Just making sure we're all on the same page. The screen we're looking at right now, it says yellow and has a Japanese character on it. And uh, what's the time code on this sucker? 24 minutes and 26 seconds. And uh, I'm going to pop that up on screen now. Excellent. And definitely not recording audio. That's good. Definitely got my audio up. That's good. Oh yeah, and just as a aside going forward, I might record the analysis portion for this tomorrow because I'm really running out of time at the moment. So you might see me change clothes and the camera change position or some stuff out the back change and that kind of thing. And just want you to know that it's just the next day. All right, I'm going to give it a three, two, one. Three, two, one, go. Yellow. Oh, so we're continuing straight from where we were. An act worthy of death, Araragi-kun. Sure. 
happen. <laughs> but somebody beat you to the punch. What was there, a train coming? Uh, yeah, I wasn't hidden by a car. I was hidden by a girl. <laughs> just I just fell on my own. Well, that's even less believable. <laughs> I think you're lying, boy. Is there a train coming? You guys should move. Uh, get up. There's a train coming. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I see what we're doing. You're funny. You're funny, show. <laughs> that was a good little fake out. I actually enjoyed that. That was a, this was a very, um, I don't know, it was something like teen movie about that whole sequence. I enjoyed it. Um, I go, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'll go through the opening again, unless I see any direct change in the visuals. I'm going to try to skim read the uh, lyrics a little bit. I really enjoy this song in this one. Like, I think I've mentioned previously that I uh, used to play Osu a lot. This would be a good Osu song. Just anything with that kind of tempo is very fun song to play. See, I can't really notice any great difference in this opening right now, but also I haven't really been watching. <laughs> I think I said last week that I really like the color palette, and that has not changed. Maybe I should look up, um, what a, what's that position called on the staff? The color director, that kind of thing. Well, not reading that. Something about a textbook horror story I read. Burn Chaos. Suruga Monkey Part 2. Alright, let's go. Are we in a bathhouse? No, okay, we're just in a traditional. Okay, so you just visited? <laughs> That's more than clutter. This is funny, I really like this. <laughs> Very to the point. <laughs> A little bit of OCD from Araragi here. Why? Oh, the CG books. That's funny. What a strange scene. Oh yeah, clean. It's definitely clean now. Uh, straight to the point. Good point, I think. Okay, so she is like cognizant while it's happening. In the hand, the bandage. Hmm. <laughs> you think you, you think you're slick, show? That's funny. Why does this guy keep? He has all these weird rumors about him. Yeah, power. They always do this blinking thing.
Hmm. Uh, yeah, I ha I have some experience. I can. I like the sound design here. It's like a race with staplers, okay. Okay, we're getting right to the point with this episode, huh? I had some help. <laughs> Aren't you smart? Well, yeah, it's, it is a little presumptuous to come up with it yourself. Valhalla Combi. Hmm. I wonder what it looks like under there. Oh. It's like a bit furry, is it? Mm. Monkey hand. Oh, technically, yeah, okay. I didn't think, yeah, I thought she just was injured under there or something. I mean, I know what a monkey's paw is, but I never, I never heard the uh, the original story. <laughs> She's a little bit. Uh, I don't know what the word is, but I like his reactions to her. They they play off each other well, I think. It's only a hand, bro. Don't be weird. <laughs> hmm. Monkey hand? Oh, no. It's just ticklish. Okay. All right. Forget, forget I said anything. Nice little bit of meta joke there as well. Hmm. It's like getting a murderer's hand and then it goes off and murders people. Interesting. So you're not completely in control. Transu. Okay. Oh, I like it when they use the uh, the physical stuff. The colors they're interesting too. <laughs> oh, that's a bit creepy. Oshino meme. <laughs> it's hard for him to be shocked by anything, I think. This is all very cordial. So what's, what's the point of all this? Oh. Um, I mean, I thought the comments implied that you weren't. <laughs> that was like, um, I'm into you. <laughs> I like uh, the way they animated him back there. It was like a, he looked like a Muppet.
Uh, what are you people in the comments talking about then? She changed. Was this with the weight? I like the stapler. The use of the staplers there. Is this a infamous shaft head tilt? Hmm. And she just pushed you away, huh? Damn. Mm, a moi? Heavy feelings. Oh, I love the voice there. Just pushed you away completely. I want to be close again. <laughs> Billing and cooing. It's funny. Mm. Like, I think they mentioned something like this in the opening. Oh, in the state. Oh, hate on the hand. Oh, is she losing control? Ooh, no, okay, we're good. Mm. Notice how all the books are all messed up now again. Hmm. I love this visual as well. I don't seem see why we can't just solve this. Oh, I mean, there's still the whole, yeah. Okay. And then the monkey's paw turned or whatever. That's one way to get by her side is you just murder him. And yeah, we're we're back with Oshino Meme. <laughs> Definitely not. Oh, is it a night thing? Okay. It's like a werewolf. Yes, I love the car. I oh, I really love this uh, location. All right, this is gonna be funny. Mm, well, we kind of had a thing recently about like weight. That's one way to do it. I think I'm pretty cute. <laughs> That's like the um the nickname thing.
what else? They keep doing the uh, the train thing too. I think it's funny. I'll be the bottom. <laughs> what got bigger? Boys who love. Okay, that's a reference that I'm just going over my head. <laughs> so she's into Yuri and BL. All right, cool. I don't think he has a position. <laughs> he does get embarrassed pretty quickly. <laughs> this is true. I don't think we were talking about that. <laughs> Come, Barusan. Where in yeah. I've got I've got a story about this. If I remember, I'll I'll tell it uh, tomorrow. Sports is shoujo. It can be both. And the trains are back. Woo. Why do you care so much, bro? Just drop it. <laughs> yeah, again. You can do both. Oh man, they go crazy right now. They're having so much fun making this. <laughs> Bruh. Don't have to say it just like that. But I mean, that's admirable as well. But Sinjo Kaharu also can't become you. Get some awesome colors in this location. They must love uh, making scenes here. Hey, I was right, Shinobu is here. That was a random prediction. Oh, for one scene. <laughs> mm, don't be weird <laughs> mm, I wonder what the history is there <laughs> this is like the third time in two weeks Kicked her out. <laughs> she really likes her donuts. Okay, so she's a vampire. Oh, yeah, she's like an incomplete vampire. Yeah, okay. Oh. I didn't, I didn't hear that one. Or Jaws, 
Sundaracha. Okay. What is it? Oh, money. I do like money. <laughs> what is your standard of living? <laughs> Monkey's paw. Stop. I'm still going. <laughs> Let me have a look at your monkey's paw. Hmm. Well, yeah, it's enough to say that it's a monkey's paw. Oh, okay. What is it then? Hmm. So what is it? A rainy devil. Mm. Hence the raincoat, okay. Not my soul. Uh, can you get rid of it? Well, kind of is a monkey's paw then, by definition, kind of. But it's gonna it's gonna fulfill your 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 wish in a way that isn't satisfactory to what you actually thought. It's you know what a monkey's paw is. But yeah, I wonder I wonder about that distinction. I guess we're gonna learn more about it next episode. Uh, this song's really good. I've said it like seven times now. <laughs> I gotta stop just saying this song's really good when I say it. I'm gonna be, uh, I'm honestly gonna be pretty sad to see it uh, leave whenever we get a new ending. But yeah, there was some interesting stuff in that episode. Um, Combo is such a good presence on screen. I really enjoy her. Uh, the show, it's just great dialogue with everybody. So Araragi's bounced off all the female cast like really well. Just conversation after conversation, which are just really enthralling. It's very well done. Uh, so as I explained kind of before, I'm going to end this episode here because I need to go do some stuff. <laughs> uh so yeah, we'll continue this tomorrow. I'll be in different clothes and the room might be slightly different, but hopefully I remember what happened today. I'm going to go through the episode anyway, so it'll jog my memory. And next time on? No next time on. I guess the sisters do all the next time on, so that's kind of fun. And cool, yeah. Thanks for watching today. I'm going to get into the analysis tomorrow. All right, I'll see you then and uh, go into the analysis portion. And it is now the next day. Uh, I am back. And I've had a kind of a night to kind of sleep on what I thought about the, that episode. And I actually do really enjoy it. I think I, I noted that I really like uh, the, the Kambaru Araragi dynamic in, in the way they speak to each other. I think Kambaru is very frank. Where a lot of the other characters in this show at least speak a little bit in riddles and that kind of thing. Like, you've got to try to read into what Senju Kahara and Hanakawa are saying, uh, for example. Where I think Hachikuji and Kambaru, they kind of just say what they think, and then we get some good reactions out of Araragi based on that. Uh, I wanted to talk about, so the couple comments that said, uh, oh yeah, it's not attraction, it's not attraction, don't don't think of it as attraction. Well, I've had a, I've had a think about it, and I think I know where you're coming from. I think the spoiler there... Or the show is kind of spoiling something in a way. It's spoiling that that's the twist, kind of, for Kambaru. Is that she's romantically interested in Senjogahara and it's um, unrequited. 
unrequited, unreciprocated, whatever the word is there. Um, Sendra Gahara isn't supposed to know that yet. And that's where the poor translation comes from. That's my running theory at the moment. And that's why there were so many comments to that effect. Where I wasn't supposed to pick up that it was romantic until now. And uh, that's where that little bit of subbing could have probably been, been better. Because from Sendra Gahara's perspective, I imagine that she didn't think it was romantic. Or maybe I'm completely off base and we're going to have to see in the next episode. Uh, either way, I'm going to get the episode up now. And we're going to ha go have a little look at what I remember from yesterday, really. Cool, so this is a bit different. We kind of opened the episode straight away from where we ended the last episode. Araragi's lying half dead on the train tracks and Sendra Gahara finds him. Gives him the money and kind of scolds him in the process of being like, one, you forgot the money and we kind of you being forgetful. And two, what the hell happened to you? <laughs> uh, he tries to brush it off by saying, I think he got hit by a car or something like that. It's like, oh, it flung him with such force into that his bike like break through concrete and that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, I don't think that that was a car. I really like how matter of fact she is about the whole situation. Like this is a regular occurrence. But still clearly a lot of care for Araragi in this situation. A little bit quirky, bit of a quirky scene, I would call it. But yeah, it's fun. Oh yeah, and then Araragi says, no, nah, I just fell on my own. It's like, bull fucking shit. <laughs> but I think he's trying not to get Sendra Gahara involved in this particular case. One, because of her closeness to Kambaru in the past. And two, because he thinks it's dangerous and Sendra Gahara might get hurt. I think it's something to that effect here. Not that I can even envision Sendra Gahara ever being hurt, ever, but anyway. But obviously Sendra Gahara isn't buying it, but she won't reveal all her cards here, I don't think. I like the other uh, kind of running gag of the scene. It kind of mirrors last episode where Kambaru was approaching. There's also a train approaching, and it's like in the back of her head, we're like, bro, get out of the way of the train. Get out of the way of the train. Get out of the way of the train. The train's going to hit you. The signposts start going off, and the sirens and whatever, the bells and whistles. Um, and we're like... Oh my god, he's going to get hit by the train. But then we see... This scene. <laughs> Again, this feels... Uh, I don't know what you would call it. Very teen movie to me. I don't know what the tone of this scene is, really. Like, I'll give you a nice surprise. There you go. And as we see, I think that... It's not particularly subtle, but the train is an extended metaphor for a... Uh, for a certain biological function of Araraki that we keep seeing. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I'm stupid, but I couldn't see anything change in the opening. It's still uh, broadly about an unrequited love and that kind of thing. And there's the scene of uh, of, of uh, Sendra Gahara cutting down uh, Kambaru. And we'll see what that means. I still have... Is that a Yuri lily? Am I dumb? Is that what the flower is? That would make sense now. <laughs> Let me let me, let me me try and see if it is. Uh, yeah, I'd be thinking that 100% it is. <laughs> Okay, that makes sense. It's a, it's a Yuri Lily. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. We're back for a bit more text on screen. I'm going to be having a little read. This is a well-made ghost story or even a nightmarish tale. A textbook horror story. Antique looking with a history, no doubt. I think it is a little bit just, you know, it's kind of like a monster appearing out of nowhere and attacking you. It's very horror movie-esque. I don't know what else he's trying to mean here, but maybe I'm dumb. What you call a classical one? Oh, like a monkey's paw. Is that what he means? I don't know. If Kambara asked me, I'd say that even though inferior to vampires, the monkey's paw is still a pretty famous item, used in various media, in different arrangements and ways. Yeah, okay. And the most important factor that makes a monkey's paw a monkey's paw is that it's said to grant the owner's wishes. It's said, however, to do it in weird ways. These two outs should be present. So this is an item with history. The monkey's paw was created in India by a sage who worked miracles as a device to teach people that they should live according to their destiny and if they were to resist their fate, it would lead to catastrophic results. Speaking about the three wishes, my association was the magic lamp from the 1001 nights and I didn't remember either story or its outcome. Moreover, around the world, such tales are quite common. Burn chaos, burn chaos. Perhaps the type of story of a man who met a creature capable of fulfilling wishes is for the people overwhelmed by great unreachable desires. Interesting. Okay. And Senja Gahara is the unreachable desire? And the specific use of the word there, overwhelmed. Like it kind of takes control. Like this kind of 
beastly desire, so to speak. Like she, she, I think they use the word in a trance. Yeah, something to that effect. So this is uh, Kambaru Saruka's house. Looks like uh, looks like her family's pretty loaded. It's a very nice traditional Japanese home. Is this perhaps in contrast to Senjogahara? Maybe. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Like Senjogahara used to have probably a fancy home like this. And then I read the comments and now the dad's paying off the debt and they're living in the smaller uh, cozy home. Let's call it cozy. Yeah, I'm just pondering a little bit uh, Kambaru as a character. She's studious. She seems to respect the elders. She seems to have a good head on her shoulders. All these kind of things. And then that contrasts with what happens to her over nighttime, potentially. Maybe. Like she loses control of her emotions in a way. But I've mentioned it a couple times now. I just enjoy the characters talking to each other. It's, it's entertaining to me. Yeah, she's, she's very matter of fact. Sorry about the clutter. Well, yeah, it's a fair bit of clutter. And we find out later that all of these are BL novels, or at least some of them are. <laughs> That's a little bit funny. Like, she keeps, like, a whole closet full in a, like, traditional Japanese home. Yeah, the way this is shot, it's very, um... It's very dry. Kind of deadpan. It's just, it's just a little bit weird. I kind of like... I really like it. It's very comedic. It made me laugh in the, uh, in the reaction as well. I didn't really pick Araragi for a bit of a clean freak, but he, he really wants to sort those, uh, those books out. Bit of OCD there. And I think the other funny part of this scene is that we later learn that they both know that they, like, fought last night and almost, like, brutally killed Araragi, really. Left him for dead on some train tracks. And now they're just, you know, cleaning up and tumbling in books and stuff. I really like the framing for this scene as well. We just keep spinning around, like, these organized piles of books in the foreground and the background. <laughs> It's clever. It feels it feels really iconic in a way. And then yeah, Kambaru just comes right in and says it. Oh yeah, sorry about last night. It's like what? Because I I completely expected this to be like like a like a different entity takes over her body, like another like a Jekyll and Hyde situation. But you know that's not the case. She had, at least seems somewhat cognizant of what happened, even if she's not in direct control. So I guess it kind of is. You know what I mean? Again, very matter of fact. I thought she would play it up a little bit more. Like, she just straightly gives you all the facts of the situation straight away. Because I think in lesser pieces of media, this whole episode would be about, we're going to, we think it's Kambaru, but we're going to catch her in the act or something like that. And then we're going to confront, and then we're going to do our emotional scene in the next episode. And that's not a bad story structure. It's just not what, Monogatari would do in my experience. They would always try for a little bit, something a little bit different, a little bit left field, and a little bit more ambitious. Which is fun. It keep, keeps keeps us media savvy people on our toes. Which is good. Bro, Araragi is such like a perv. Look at this. And they keep doing the thing with the hair. Like, like come on, what are we doing here? <laughs> At least she's not like nine this time. <laughs> They seemingly really like doing this with scenes, uh, Studio Shaft with the show. Just always something in the background that we keep getting reminded of. Like a constant sound or a constant visual that keeps coming back between a scene, along with the red scenes and, and the black scenes and all that kind of thing. Uh, just something to split it up, something to make us feel a little bit more in the location as well. I don't mind it as a technique, it's definitely unique. But, uh, but here we see, I, I forget what this is, you see this at a lot of traditional bathhouses in Japan and that kind of thing, I think. I uh, don't exactly know what it does. Traditional Japanese gardens and that kind of thing normally have these. I think it's just supposed to make a noise. <laughs> Corrections uh, appreciated. I don't believe in what I can't say, so I believe in what I can say. And in the back we see Vampire, Koyomi Vampire, which is his deal. And Subasa Cat, which I'm guessing has happened in the past with Hanakawa. So this is, yeah, in, in reference to his past experience with these kind of things. Not to mention the two that we know, which is uh, Hitagi Crab and uh, Mayoi Snail. I think it's interesting that we see a track and field race with staplers as well. And then it picks up tempo as Kambara's emotions pick up as well. There's something there, I think. Um, the, the stapler, obviously representing Senju Gahara. So yeah, again, like... This is a scene of two characters talking, and we're cutting to a 
number of different techniques during it to keep the conversation engaging. So if you're not invested in the story, uh, like the opposite of me, I don't know what you're doing if you're not invested in the story, you still got something visual going on, keeping your brain ticking along, that kind of thing. It's never a boring watch. Is, is my point. And I could see why rewatches thrive because you notice this kind of stuff more and you can glean more meaning from it. Valhalla Jewel, it's a well thought out name, isn't it? I'm the one that came up with it. You're not supposed to nickname yourself. Again, she's very she's very blunt and not very socially aware. Lots of, lots of different words for Kambaro. I really like her as a character. All the characters in this show, they're, they're all very, they've all got something going on, like some little weird quirks and that kind of thing. So yeah, Araragi immediately goes, oh yeah, it's a monkey's paw. And then later, Oshino Meme uh, kind of debunks this. And I'm not really sure about the nuance there yet. Because it seems what Oshino Meme describes is also a monkey's paw. Perhaps it's to do with the demon involved and in stealing the soul. Again, we'll probably see next episode what the, what the purpose of this is. And if there's three wishes and she's made one, I reckon she's going to make another as well. It would just make sense from a stakes-raising perspective but maybe we're not going that direction at all and I'm, I'm dumb we'll see so yeah, he touches the monkey's paw and she makes like a weird hentai noise it's like there's no reason for you to make that noise that breaks apart your established character i agree i like the <laughs> bit of lamp shading bit of meta knowledge there it's nice <laughs> clever clever show clever show it got a chocolate out of me anyway so here we see they explaining like the trance i guess so the hand kind of has control, kind of not sometimes. Maybe it's Kambaru, maybe it's not. She says, I'm the one that assaulted you last night, but I don't really have any memory of it. So it's kind of like a dream in a way. And this is visually explained with kind of this separate hand, which looks, I don't even know what I would describe that as. It's uh, unsettling to say the least, kind of grabbing the real hand and smushing it into, like, tomato relish. <laughs> um, great little visual metaphor again. I love the techniques involved. I love the um, the use of the real, like, tomato relish or whatever it is. Again, Bakemonogatari just seems like such a visually engaging show. Like, there's always something going on. You're never bored. The episodes fly by. It's, it's, a, real, it's a real credit to everybody involved in the production team. Again, more unsettling imagery here as we see this like hand contorting and the hair growing out of it like a monkey's paw. Very horror movie. I actually really like it. It underpins like, again, that's like a realistic looking hand. Puts us in the shoes of the characters. Uns yeah, really unsettling imagery. And then this one here, I don't even know what to make of this because this is the same shade as the hand before. It's still got hair growing out of it, but there's like hands on top of the fingers and then we immediately cut to Kambaru's hand. <laughs> what are they trying to say there? But again, fucking cool ass. But since he showed me that first, I'm confident that I won't be shocked no matter what follows. And then he proceeds to get shocked like five more times in this episode. It's a little bit funny. Like Kambaru really stumps Araragi. Sends him... Sends him flying both comedically and physically. <laughs> uh, so Kambara's like, I'm a lesbian. And then she's like, I'm into Yuri. And we get this like Muppet Araragi the whole time. Like, I'm not going to be shocked no matter what you say. Turns into a Muppet next scene. Yeah, right. <laughs> to me, Senju Kahara was my pure and perfect upperclassman. And yeah, we get a more direct connection between the track and field and the staplers here. So here we see Kambaru's tone change, and the scene tone changes completely as well. She starts talking about this disease that Sanjo Gahara had uh, when she entered high school, which is the whole weight thing going on. She also mentions that she would have just been happy standing by Sanjo Gahara's side, so I think that's another indicator that she didn't really confess to Sanjo Gahara, so to say. Yeah, I can't play the clip, obviously. There's a little bit of, like kind of steady cam going on in this scene, uh, as opposed to the straight up and down shots that we saw before. Even if I couldn't do that, I thought I could heal her heart just by being with her. And we see heavy feelings. I really thought so. So that's kind of, my heavy feelings could have fulfilled the, the weight gap there. 
that Senjo Gahara had, but I was rejected with no consideration. Now, your heavy feelings weren't enough. Or at least she thinks that. In reality, Senjo Gahara probably just wasn't in that right mind space at that time. And then I might play a little clip here. This is where it kind of gets fever pitch, where Kambaru changes her focus to Araragi, and the camera movement starts going crazy. Like It's very, very shaky. We also get this visual of the staples on the on the uh, on the on the female body here, which I'm guessing is Kambaru's. Like like Senju Gahara is imprinted on her very self, in a way, and it hurts. Again, very uh, very like like the eye poke from the last episode, right? Where there was the pen very close to the human eye. We can feel this pain, if you know what I mean. It's very relatable. Like I don't want a staple in my skin. <laughs> that would hurt. The blacks and whites again. Interesting. And then before she kind of catches herself before completely losing control. And we see as a result, kind of a visual metaphor, all the books that they had stacked up fall over. So kind of she was keeping control. All the books are stacked up nice and neatly. And then once she kind of starts to lose it a little bit, the books start to fall. Clever. Very clever. And kind of tragic on Kambaru's part. It's a very mature conversation between these two. She straight up says, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of you right now. If only I was a man, it only didn't happen because I was a woman. I don't think that's the case either, necessarily. But, um, but yeah, very tragic. Very well done scene. This is something that I would have expected in the next episode after we kind of fuffed around a little bit in this episode. But they're kind of just getting straight to the point and getting to something more interesting. Again, it's good. <sighs> It's, it's such a clever show from a writing perspective and a visual perspective. Yeah, and kind of putting a climax to this visual metaphor, we've got the staples all in the head, the staples around basically her entire body. I'd already become absolutely inhuman. Again, relating to the whole monkey's paw thing going on. Just another kind of terrifying image. But again, just a great visual representation of what's going on. Layers upon layers of meaning. I wished on this paw to be by Senju Gahara's side. It's kind of beast, monkey in the background as well. And yeah, that's kind of the tragedy of it all. Yeah, that's 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 the main motivation of this character for their actions during this arc. It's a completely understandable motivation, even if it's not morally the correct thing to do in this situation. I absolutely adore that scene. Now that I've gone back and looked at it all, I think it might be one of the best scenes in the show. Just... These two in, I'm guessing, Kambaru's bedroom. Put it up for put it up for one of the best scenes in the show. It's, it's up there. I think this is a little bit of foreshadowing, a little setup for the next episode. It's dangerous to be out at night with your left arm, right? Well, obviously, she's going to change at some point again, right? It just, just makes sense storytelling-wise. Uh, I also like the purpose of this upcoming, I guess, like five minutes of this episode, where it's we've just come off some heavy stuff, right? And as a result, we're going to have about five minutes of comedy, or at least something a bit light, brings a bit of levity, good pacing, right? If we're all down all the time, it becomes a bit of a slog, and I, I really like how we're keeping it fresh. So I don't really know what she's doing here. Like, is she just, is she fucking with him? Is she, um, is she trying to get him to slip up so he can be like, caught you, caught you in 4K, send your guard, this guy cheats. Now be with me. <laughs> I don't think that's really going to work. And yeah, we're, extending from the start of the episode, we see the train, the whole train thing going on. I'm seriously up for it. I'll be the bottom to your top anytime. Top? Bottom? All right. <laughs> they're, getting, they're getting their jerks off. It's funny. This is a reference to something Japanese that I don't know. But I know it, you know? It's one of them. But yeah, now, now they're going to talk about bail for a bit, and then they're going to talk about bike shorts and panties for a bit. You know, solid conversation topics. If you cling on to that cheap fantasy of womanhood, you'll be so insistent on purity that you can't even say hello. There's no way around it. Even girls like to talk dirty. This is just facts. <laughs> Anybody over the age of, like, fucking 14 could tell you this. I guess it may be different in Japan. They may have different, like cultural standards and that kind of thing but yeah look at Araragi's face here he's like 
He's like mortified. Like, come on, dude, get with the program. Now it's time for my little story. Uh, there was a whole thing when I used to play football. I don't know if you you guys have like compression like shorts for sport and that kind of thing over wherever you guys live. Uh, but we have a brand and it's called Skins. And somebody was wearing Skins and then they said, oh yeah, I'm not wearing any underwear underneath this. And it start, sparked a whole conversation. Do you wear underwear underneath Skins? And I'm like, of course you fucking do. And then other people were like, no, no, I don't, I don't. And it was this whole thing for like ages. <sighs> so all this is reminding me of like a debate that I had like 10 years ago. <laughs> With a bunch of people my own age. Maybe not 10 years ago. Maybe more like six. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's a little bit funny to me. Just reminds me of old times. The trains again. I think there's like three trains this time. <laughs> uh, he's really in, he's really, he's really talked up about this whole no panties thing. All right. Let's get a grip. Like again, right? This is like a dirty, stupid joke scene, right? But I think it's well directed. I think the visual metaphors are funny. It's obviously high effort and serves a purpose in the narrative. So there's all these different things going on that we can have a look at. And then, you know, the, the kind of rambunctious nature of the scene grinds to a halt with the no matter how hard you try, you can't take Senjugahara's place. It kind of regains his senses in it all and just says it says what he means right out loud. You know, puts a pin in it. It's another important moment in the story or this arc in particular no one can become anyone else's replacement this is the it works the same way like Sendra Gahara is Sendra Gahara and Kambaru is Kambaru and I think part of the story is going to be understanding that as well now that we've been here what two three times now I'm really starting to adore this location I think it's so interesting I just wonder what it says about Oshino Meme that he lives in this abandoned school, industrial construction site thing. Just a great choice. Great creative choice. Uh, Shinobu's back for like two seconds again. And then Kambaru's like, who the hell is that? And then again, Araragi's treating her with some level of disdain. I just, yeah, we need some backstory there. We know she's a ruined vampire or whatever. Dunno. What's this, Araragi? You brought a different girl again today? Yeah, he's very good at that. He brings different women all the time just an absolute pervert that Araragi so Shinobu's like sulking because of not getting any donuts it's not what I thought happened <laughs> bit random she's been like that since yesterday so she's been sulking about donuts for a full like 24 hours I mean honestly same but like come on <laughs> then Oshina Meme implies something about Suruga meaning bondage torture is that another wordplay thing or is he just being a weirdo I don't know <laughs> So that young lady's left arm isn't a monkey's paw. <laughs> what does this mean? And, and then I think he kind of goes on to explain that it kind of is just a monkey's paw, but kind of different. Again, I'm going to reread it here, but I don't know. I've never heard of a monkey's paw binding onto its owner. Is that the difference? Oshina Meme says it's like from a mummy. And if it acquired life by binding to you, it must be a rainy devil instead. And that's the connection to like the raincoat. So is like a rainy devil a thing in folklore and that kind of thing? Or did they kind of just make it up for the show? Because if not, it's a very provocative name. I really like it. Yeah, and then we get into the soul stealing part. Okay. In exchange for your soul, it grants three wishes. So to our knowledge right now, one wish has been granted. Maybe she asks for another wish. It takes more of a body. Like the, like the growth moves up her arm a little bit more. Something to that effect. And then the, the conflict of the final episode in this arc becomes don't make that third wish, that kind of shit. I don't know. We'll see. And we get to see right now. So let me pop over to the next episode right now. I'll get it up. Cool. And we're back for, what is this, episode eight, I want to say? And the third episode in this arc and the finale to this arc. So we, we get to see it all wrapped up now. Let me get that sucker on screen. A uh, time code of 2439. For those following at home. And cool. I'll whack a time code in the bottom corner. And we're going to give this a 3, 2, 1, go. Okay. So we're obviously at a different scene. Okay. A bit of backstory about this. I was given to a by her late mother. 
Okay. Okay, so one of the wishes was already done. Oh. Okay, this is going some direction I didn't even think. So Kambaru hasn't been entirely honest. About the rainy devil, brother. Okay. That's terrifying. <laughs> Oh. Okay, that seems bad. That sounds like what happened to me, okay. That wouldn't work. Oh, okay. I kind of understand. Okay. She turned her attention to basketball. Eh. Okay. Because she was cheating, <laughs> essentially, kind of. That must have been difficult. Sendra Kahara seems very different in the past. Ski. That's sad. <laughs> Would she have used it against, like, to get Senjukahara's weight back? Okay. Okay. Smart. <laughs> Haunted by that stupid Araragi with his stupid hair thing. Okay. <laughs> End of flashback time for the theme song. Okay, all right. That's everything is now clear. Most of my theories were dumb.
It's weird that we've gotten like little to no Sendra Gahara in this um in this arc so far other than the first episode. She has to come into it at some point. There has to be some kind of resolution there, right? Okay, so they just explained that to Oshino Meme as well. What do you mean so-called authority? You seem to know everybody and everything. Yeah, okay, makes sense with the themes of the arc. Mm, this is a test. Well, that's obviously not an option. Can't play basketball with an arm, with with one arm. Well, I guess he can, but probably not as well. <laughs> yeah. There's got to be a better solution than that. Yeah. Hmm. Aragi being naive is another theme in this arc, I think. Because she wanted it to happen? But it's not a monkey's paw. This is a good twist as well. I like this. Hmm. Which is fair enough. Okay, if you're bullying, that they deserve to get beaten up. I don't think Araragi deserves to die for dating Sendra Gahara, though. Hmm. So it kind of takes your true desires. Okay. She almost convinced herself in a way. Yeah. So it kind of hasn't been her arm for years. Okay.
assailant's excuse. I kind of don't believe that entirely either. Okay. Okay. What is this scene? What the hell? <laughs> okay, so she needs to live off of his blood? When is this taking place? So is he going to fight Kambaru? What do they mean by contract? Okay. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's like a power up for him. Hmm. So the pressure's on Araragi. What are you going to do? Are you going to do the hard-working thing? Are you going to take the hard path or the easy path? Okay, that's curious. Yeah, why do you? Hating people is a part of life. <laughs> Good answer. That's a bit terrifying. Dude, he's so intense. He's putting it all on the line. I think Oshina Mamekan respects that in a way. Ooh, I like this. <laughs> Great. Nah, she. The old Kambaru can't come to the phone right now. Oh, this is sick. Look at this animation. Oh, there goes your arm. Ooh, takes the legs. Oh my goodness. This is so sick. Hmm. 
Okay. It's still not the answer, I don't think. Look at look at our hero over here. And she feels so isolated by this all. I love the framing here. Okay, another bit of foreshadowing for that. Oh wait, no, no, no. Yeah, okay. I thought it was uh, Hanakawa. Don't know why. Hmm. That's Cap. See, but the the, the you in this in this realm doesn't want to give up. Oh, that's a crazy sound. Oh my god, the colors here too. Oh, that's like dank and rumper blood. Hell yeah. Is that his intestines? <laughs> this is so sick. What the hell? Oh, is she here? Yes, Queen. <gasps> what does this do? <gasps> Smart. I thought you were smarter than that. You should have just known you was lying. Yeah, actually, you're right. You're scum. Get him, queen. <laughs> Smart. I mean, he did it with good intentions, I think. Oh. Love the song. Oh my god. Oh the v her VA is killing this too. They say even if you were immortal, you'd still go through all this. Is is Central Kahara kind of showing how much she loves Araragi in front of Kambaro? That's what he does. Um... This is this is like romantic. My god. Oh, yeah, okay, good point.
Yeah, he seems insane. Magnificent bastard. <laughs> Okay, what are we doing here? Mm. Well, that's tragic. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of knew Senju Kahoru would come in and just save the day, but yeah, she, she really did. <laughs> she most certainly is. How nice was that? What a great ending. <laughs> we always end an arc here every time at least we didn't do the same shot so he kind of wakes up and then sees the person it's funny I like this design it's like punk rock in a way like pop punk how's, how's the old arm doing still got it bandaged up Mm. Basketball. Okay, so there's some kind of physical limit there left. <laughs> Good to see she's still herself, though. Ah, who can't do next time ones. <laughs> ah, that was another great episode. <laughs> and I was definitely recording, right? Yeah, I was definitely recording. Awesome. Okay. All right, time to get into a bit of analysis then. Uh, yeah, that the end of that arc was, like, awesome. <laughs> it was everything I could have wanted from it, really. It was, it was Senja Gahara showing up, saving the day, just absolutely heroing out of control. How good? How good was that? I don't even know what else to say. <laughs> uh, other than all of my predictions up to this point have kind of been wrong and like the previous portion of this video is kind of garbage. What I'm still confused about is that did Senja Gahara know the romantic implication before or did she just learn it now and have they been absolutely stuffed around by the combination of the bad subbing and these comments just throwing my brain for a loop with the whole thing? I guess it really doesn't matter in the end. But I just want to know if I'm dumb or not. Maybe I'm dumb. I don't know. Anyway, let me bring the episode up. And yeah, I'm just going to pause on some key stuff and have a little chat. This one will probably be a little bit shorter considering it was in large part action as opposed to visual stuff to analyze and that kind of thing. But we'll see how we go. So the mummified hand was kind of given to uh, Kambalaru by her late mother. Which <laughs> Was her late mother like... An archaeologist or something? Was she like Indiana Jones? It's unclear. But as we can see here, that the hand is kind of just a hand at this point, and she didn't even notice later that it had already grown to encompass her full like forearm. And I know it's been brought up a couple times, but we're already kind of playing with the unreliable narrative thing, right? Because this is Kambaru telling her own kind of backstory flashback thing, right? In a way where... She wanted to convince everybody, even herself in some ways, that she didn't actually want to hurt these people, but she did. And and that's the route she took, and she needs to live with that. Because in this, like, oh yeah, all of her actions seem maybe not completely justifiable, but, you know, she was a kid, and she did the wrong thing. She just wanted to run past, and then the monkey's paw curled. The monkey's paw. But it isn't a monkey's paw, is it? So she really wanted those kids to get hurt, and that was one of her wishes. Then we learn later that they're maybe making fun of her for having dead parents, and then it's like, yeah, those kids deserve to get beat up. Maybe not Araragi for liking Sendra Gahara, that's not really as much of a crime. <laughs>
But anyway, I'm rambling. We'll, we'll continue. I don't know what the deal with the with these dudes is. Like the like the, I don't know if it's like a hard hat and like a like a, like a work uniform on that kind of thing. On like a flat orange figure, I've got no I- idea what that's supposed to represent. Uh, especially when talking about like an elementary school kid in a running contest, I can't make a connection there. Uh, any insight would be appreciated. Ah, uh, yeah, this whole scene was terrifying. Like, kind of this rainy devil. Like, this is her dream, right? Her dream is like a surveillance camera of her own home, like a paranormal activity of her own house. And there's some kind of devil crawls into her bed and then leaves and leaves something in there. That's kind of insane. Like, I wouldn't sleep for weeks. (laughs) She stumbled upon this monkey's paw story and then decided, oh, yeah, that's what happened to me, yeah. When in reality, she just wasn't confronting what she'd actually done. This is so interesting. I wonder if there's more stuff like this. I think some of the comments said before that there's more stuff with like the unreliable narrator stuff and just going back and uh, like this rewatch right here. It's so intriguing. So she thought the second wish could undo the first wish, but she became scared. I don't think that's the case either. Maybe she became hesitant when she learned it was actually real, but maybe not scared that the wish wouldn't get fulfilled. It fulfills every time. Maybe she didn't want those people to be... uh, Maybe she didn't want to take back her wish. Maybe she really wanted this kind of thing to happen to them. It's very human. I like it. And then maybe thinking on this whole, like this whole amount of baggage with the track and field thing, she went to try basketball and that kind of thing. This is, hmm, I wonder what's happening here. Because once we learn new information later in the episode, all of this becomes, if one part of it is told with little lies, then all of it could be told with little lies, you know? So this is kind of, She told this story to Araragi in this scene last episode, if that makes any sense. And we're only seeing it now. Yeah, okay. And that's why Araragi is narrating this part. Makes sense. I really love this little bit of animation on Kambalu here. A lot of of, uh, personality put in that little, little part there. But then that, yeah, that's not the truth either, that she didn't want to race Senju Gahara because of the whole monkey's paw situation. Oh, and then when Araragi says, like, immediately, he's like, oh, it's a monkey's paw. She's like, yeah, yeah, it's a monkey's paw. Hmm. Okay. (laughs) That's awesome. I actually really like that. Huh. (laughs) It's all coming together again. How good's this? That's another, maybe not as good as Last Ark's twist, but still, like, a really good twist. Like, it makes you reinterpret old scenes, if you know what I mean. Where that where you learn that she was willing in her crimes, even if she didn't always mean it wholeheartedly, if you know what I mean. There's there's that dark part in everybody, I think. And she just needs to accept that that's a part of herself as well. That she wants, sometimes she just wants people to die. <laughs> I think we've all been there, maybe. I don't know. I'm I'm there most days. <laughs> this is one part I know she's not lying about. Senju Gahara healed me. I think she's very important. Because Kambado must have been having some kind of, not crisis of faith as per se, but kind of like, yeah, a bit of self, self-loathing self for the crimes that she's done in the past. And, you know, she'll always live with that kind of stuff. Kind of like PTSD, but not really. But Sandra Gahara helped get that off her mind. She was She was a bit tortured in the past and she really helped. I think that's true. Yeah, that's definitely not one of the white little lies she told. At that point, I understand why my mother gave me the monkey's paw. She wanted me to become a person who could overcome any trial with my own strength. I think that's probably true as well. At least in a way. Maybe that's wishful thinking. But yeah, so all of these tribulations didn't lead to Kambala using the the hand again. Until she sees Senju Gahara with Araragi. Even to the point where she learned of Senju Gahara's problem, she probably could have used the monkey's paw to fix her weight issue. I don't know if it would have worked in the way that we would have wanted it to, but she didn't use it. It was only the very angry, fierce emotion of jealousy that caused her to use it. That's very interesting. Flawed characters like Kambaru are always very more interesting than people that are always morally right, if that makes sense. I think that's it's good character writing. And she's kind of haunted by these, like, 
weird alien Araragis with the hair thing going on still. <laughs> uh, if these things haunted my nightmares, maybe I would use the hand again. And yeah, as we can see, the paw grows as she, you know, used another wish on it. And before she knew it, it became part of her. And this gave me a good laugh during the during the reaction. End of flashback, next is the theme song. It's like, very matter of fact, this is what's happening. Fourth wall breaking, bit of meta stuff. I like it. It's one of my personal... Uh, I don't mind meta stuff like this in my fiction. People think it's a little bit cheesy, but uh, but I, I don't mind it. <laughs> and again, I didn't see anything too different in the opening, so I'm just going to skip it again. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I'll go back and have another look at it. Uh, a bit more text on the screen. Let's have a read. The rainy devil is said to be a very violent devil. Above all, it loves people's anger and hostility, grievance and repentance, envy and jealousy, hmm, envy and jealousy, and all the dark traits and negative emotions. Okay, makes sense. It sees through all the dark sides of the human, provokes them, pulls them out, and lets them manifest themselves. It listens to wishes in a malevolent way and fulfills them in a malevolent way. So yet yeah, it always takes the underlying darker meaning what they truly believe in their heart to be the case and manifests it. So so even if Kambaru said in perfect English words, I want to be faster than all those other kids, it would understand that deep down in her heart, she wanted those kids beaten up. Interesting. Interesting oddity. As for the contract, the contract itself is that. In exchange for human soul, it fulfills three wishes. After fulfilling those three wishes, it captures the human's body and soul. In other words, in the end, the human turns into a devil, and that's the result. Like the dark emotions of you. If you if you if you give in to those darker emotions, you lose the humanity of yourself. But in turn, I think that's also very human to follow those darker emotions. We're getting deep here again today. We got deep in uh in Land of the Lustrous as well. Something about these shows, man. If Kambaru had made a wish to solve the situation, when she found out Senju Gahara's secret a year ago, that wish wouldn't have been granted, because it didn't come from a darker place. Okay, interesting. The rainy devil can only fulfill the negative, aggressive wishes. While there's a front side, there's a back side too. She asked to have quick legs because she hated her classmates. She asked to be by Senju Gahara's side because she hated Araragi Koyomi. Expel, destroy, expel, destroy. Okay. Yeah, kind of... So this is kind of... If you read this before the episode, it's kind of like huge spoilers. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's... Uh, what's the word? I think it's actually quite good that it goes that quickly through the start because if you actually pause and read all of that before the episode, I think you lose a bit of the oomph. Indeed, it reads the backside. Indeed, it sees the backside. The devil perceives the thing wished unconsciously. I won't save you. I'll simply lend a hand. Is that a pun? Does that work in Japanese? Or, or am I being dumb? Anyway. Oshino is very smug. <laughs> like, he, he has all the answers. I've never seen a situation where he wasn't in complete control. And that can sometimes be a little bit grating for me in a character, but I think he pulls it off by being a little bit... He's, he's very suave, I would call it. So, for a start, Oshino Meme says, you got one or two options, right? We need to kill Araragi and fulfill the contract, or we need to get rid of the arm, right? Of course, there's always a third option, and it takes the most hard work out of Araragi, so of course he goes for it. I think, is this Oshino Meme kind of testing him? Anyway, it's irrelevant. Then he, he tells, he reads through Kambaro a little bit. You tried to kill someone. Just immediately goes and says it. I think he also says earlier, you're the only one that can solve this problem, uh, Kambaru, when talking to her. Like, he knows what's up. And then Araragi believes all of all of what Kambaru had to say, like I did as the audience, right? Again, we're put directly in Araragi's shoes. She didn't want to kill anybody, she just wants to be with Senjo Gahara. And this is kind of mirroring, kind of last episode, where Araragi's kind of uh, naive about women in general, right? That, that they can tell dirty jokes and all this kind of other stuff, right? Just He's completely naive to this other side of the people he's with, right? And this is mirrored here again. He's naive about how Kambaru could actually be like this. Because while she's got this studious kind of outside going on, she's also got this dark inner emotions. And both 
Araragi and us, the audience, are shocked at this reveal, right? Where Oshno Mame, he's been around the block a little bit and he knows that everybody's not all sunshine and roses all the time. It's good. And here it is. Here's the reveal. Why do you think that that arm actually beat up those kids in the flashback, right? Well, doesn't the monkey's paw fulfill wishes in a way the owner doesn't intend? But there's just one thing, mate. It's not a monkey's paw. I don't understand what this Oshino's line off part is, but, uh... <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great little reveal. Again, I was still thinking it was a monkey's paw, and what was the difference between the two? That's obviously the difference. It's intent. It's blaming your own personal dark emotions behind your wish instead of some arbitrary dark thing that the monkey's paw just decides. It's an interesting little subversion there. And it definitely caught me off guard. So yeah, here it is a little bit more. I didn't think you made that wish consciously. In your own conscious mind, you wish to run faster. But the backside of the wish, the darker side of the wish, is the one that the rainy devil took. And yeah, Oshina Meme spells it right out. It's only a rationalization that you thought it was a monkey's paw. You couldn't believe that some part of you actually wanted this to happen to those kids. Then we go to this scene. Strange. It's a strange one, I'll, I'll say. Yeah, definitely, definitely strange. Uh, I don't know what the deal is with Shinobu at all. That's if, if it's been explained, I don't know. <laughs> I just really don't know what's going on here. I know that she's sucking his blood to kind of get him powered up, in a way, based on his lingering vampirism. It's, other than an interesting bit of lore... I don't really know what else to make of it, really. Let's continue on. So at this point, does Oshino Meme already have the idea about calling in Senju Gahara? And that's how revealing how much Senju Gahara likes and feels for Araragi is part of breaking down the contract of the devil. So he believes that and chooses to hold this information away from Araragi. Is it not until the conversation right at the end where where he's like, why did you forgive uh, Kambaro so easily, even after you learned that she had tried to kill you. <laughs> well, liking Senju Gahara isn't a crime. Well, it's not a crime I... It's a crime I can forgive anyway. Was that the tick-off that Oshino Meme needed to make the call? That he knew that that would be the solution to the problem? Oh, see, it's actually here. Okay. So he's like, Araragi, give me a bag. It'll be too heavy to fight with. When in reality, he knows that Araragi's phone is in the bag and that he's going to make the call to Senju Gahara. Interesting, interesting. Such a little detail comes back in an in a awesome way. That's really cool. Yeah, if looking up to Senja Gahara is the crime that Kambado is guilty of, I think I can forgive her. You're very likable, Araragi. I like that. I like that from you. It's in direct contrast to some of you in some other scenes, though. It's interesting. Yeah, even after the Shinobu thing, I don't think you can manifest more than a tenth of the power you did at your peak vampirism. Okay. There's definitely a flashback coming that's going to explain a lot of this and it's going to make me happy when it does and it's going to all click in my brain and it's going to make sense. I hope. <laughs> and then, yeah, this action scene starts. Uh, I might pause it at the end and just say, that was really awesome. We'll say. Well, for a start, I wonder what it means that the dark kind of classroom that they've got going in, that they've kind of trapped her in, going all white, what's that supposed to indicate? Is this just how they're perceiving the situation based on their superhuman abilities? Maybe. Then the use of color in this scene is amazing as well. I wish I was more of an animation guy so I could go in and talk about uh, why it looks so good from an animation perspective, but I just don't have the chops there. Uh, I can assure you that it's dynamic. It flows really well. Uh, I love the art of it. Uh, there's some just some great artistry in it all. Uh, if there's some specific stuff involved that you want to mention in the comments, I'll be more than willing to look at them as well. Very, very well done scene. I really like this one. Not only does the rainy devil want to attack me, so the arm, not only does the arm want to attack me, but the rest of Kambaldo does as well. So this dark side is actually manifesting. It's not It's not just the rainy devil. It's not the, the monkey's paw. It is Kambaldo, and that is okay. All right. She's resenting and rejecting the fact that I won't be killed. Kambaru has no intention of giving up on Senjo Gahara. So Kambaru, back, we flash back to the scene before, 
she suggests cut the arm off. Now, based on her actions in the previous scene that we just saw, she doesn't believe that. She really still wants to kill Araragi. She still thinks, she's still that jealous of him. But this is kind of a rational self, right? She's saying, yeah, cut it off. It's, it's no good. And Araragi is still, even at this point, going, no, you need to keep your arm. What about your basketball? Like, the basketball isn't that important compared to killing people, man. But he's that, like, kind of person, you know? That one step beyond. I mentioned in the reaction portion, I really like the framing of the scene, like in between, I'm guessing all this like school equipment and that kind of thing. We have Kambalu, like isolated, still away from Araragi. I don't really know where to take this. Is this kind of like a manifestation of the negative emotions? Maybe, maybe that's me overanalyzing it, but, uh, but I really enjoy it. Even Araragi still at this point is still like believing it, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. And Oshinomeme is like, nah, dog. <laughs> Nah, <laughs> I don't care anymore, even about Sendra Kahara. If this thing is that dangerous, I don't want to keep it. Well, that's not true. Again, I'm I'm loving this like double-sided thing we got going on with Kambado. She's very complex. She's shown a lot of different sides. I like it. I wanted to give a shout out here to the pink blood. I yeah, <laughs> I like Danganron, but that's all. And we kind of see like. This is what she's really thinking, deep down underneath. Like, the other side of the other side of the other side. I hate this guy. Like, extreme envy and jealousy. Alright, cool. This was a particularly gnarly sequence. The way I understand it is that is that's his, like, intestines. And he's swinging him around by his intestines. Because she, like, kicked a hole through him. He's, like, super immortal, by the way. Like, anybody else would have died to this, right? Yeah, okay. Just, yeah, the whites on the colors here is such an interesting way to do the scene. And, like, kind of these guises of uh, of desks and chairs and that kind of thing. Very, uh, very creative. Because normally, if, if this scene is taking place the way we perceive it, it is just darkness, complete darkness. They're fighting in complete, yeah. And only their supernatural sides are allowing this to actually continue. All right, cool. And now our queen is here to save the day. This was like, this is like you're, you're sitting in like the theater. This is like your stand up and clap moment. Woo! So I kind of like, Sendra Gahara walks in, first priority. Have to tell Araragi off. Like, there's no other way. <laughs> Again, it, it demonstrates the kind of her priorities in all of this. It helps the devil realize that this contract is untenable, in a way. Even more so demonstrates the connection that these two have even more. Didn't we promise not to do that kind of thing when we started going out? Yeah, like directly. And you, you're you the one that brought up the promise, Araragi, you scum. You should have kept her in the loop. Uh, yeah, I, I'm theorizing that this was to keep her safe in a way, away from the dangerous Kambalu, but he really should have told her probably, right? It, she deserves to know all the information. But in the end, Sendra Gahara still appreciates all that he's doing going above and beyond for for her like kind of overly dedicating himself to her she appreciates that i think anyway you deserve ten thousand deaths but it seems like you've already died ten thousand times just clever dialogue after clever piece of dialogue <laughs> what a show honestly is this kind of one of the final demonstrations to the oddity to the to the rainy devil that this contract is untenable, where she kind of puts her life directly in danger because of Araragi, right? He would kill for me, I would kill for her. The front side of this wish will never become true because of the dark side, if that makes any sense. You killing Araragi will never in a million years make Senju Gahara like you. Is that kind of what's happening? Again, it's left up to interpretation, I think. Yeah, and here it is in direct text. Did you really think that if you died, it would solve everything, Araragi? If you died, I would stop at nothing to kill Gambado. It wouldn't solve a thing. Another good piece of contrast here is this like dangerous being that we just saw beating the fuck out of uh, Araragi is now cowering in a corner. Kind of demonstrates the importance of Senju Gahara to uh, Gambado. It's good. All right, I was being dumb and I didn't really read it during the episode. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. So making it impossible for the conscious side of the wish to be fulfilled by the these events transpiring. And that kind of cancels it out. All right, cool. And then, yeah, the killing Kambaru, if 
uh, Araragi died is another piece of evidence that the wish cannot be fulfilled. It's untenable. Rip up the contract. Can't happen. I think Magnificent Bastard is a good way to describe Oshino Meme. He kind of, yeah, I definitely zeroed in on the bastard part initially, but yeah, he's come around. I like him. So kind of, yeah, once the rainy devil sees that the contract is this way, the real Kambaru kind of appears, especially in the face of Senjo Gahara. And Kambaru brings forward the straight up confession and Senjo Gahara kind of callously just not happening. I don't like you that way, but even still, you'll stay by my side, question mark? I'm not really sure about this uh, pose here. It's a little bit promiscuous or something to that effect. But uh, it doesn't really match the sentiment of the conversation, I don't think. It's an <laughs> it's a strange one. All right, moving on. And then Araragi kind of repeats his thesis statement here. I'm never going to stop meddling or doing unwelcome favors or anything like that. That's just who I am. But even still, they're all really hard to deal with. And yeah, put a, put a bow on it. It's done. I like it. And then it seems like we're going to do something like this every single time. It's always going to be the next morning and it's going to be like, Oi, brother, wake up. We're, we're the sisters and we're trying to do something and we're trying to get you to, you know, do some stuff or whatever. I don't really know what their deal is yet, but is this like the signifier that the, the arc's over? Maybe. All right, anyway. Yeah, and very much like the previous arc, Araragi goes to get on his bike and sees the character of said arc and has a little conversation with them. Uh, Kambaro goes into the fact that she's not doing basketball anymore, mostly because her arm doesn't work, but I also think, hey, there's probably some baggage there. Like, it's she's turned over a new leaf in her life, so she's leaving the old her behind a little bit. Maybe this is what this costuming's trying to say in a way as well. I really like her outfit, by the way. I think it's cool. Especially with the with the bandage. It looks really sick. Yeah, the devil's gone, but my arm isn't back to normal. And true to the contradictory nature of Kambaro and her character up to this point, we see that her arm's just fine. <laughs> Extremely powerful still, even. So, <laughs> great. Yeah, that's another great little bow on the arc. Loved it. And there we are. Uh, well, that was great again. I don't know where I'd rank it in in the whole grand scheme of the arcs we've seen so far. I'd have I'd need to sleep on it again, I think. But uh, but I really did enjoy it again. They really know how to create a satisfying conclusion to what they have going on, in a way that makes me rethink everything that I'd seen previous as well. Just very well written, very well executed. I c I really don't have many complaints. Yeah, I was I was trying to think of any, and I really can't. So. But yeah, the way I understand it is the next arc is just two episodes, so expect that next week, pending time and that kind of thing. Uh, we'll, we'll see. But it, but it should happen. Uh, just reiterating the Tuesday slot, taking suggestions for comedy shows, slice of life shows, anything that's a little less analysis heavy, a little bit lighter, that kind of thing. And yeah, that slot will probably start up not next week, but the week after, I think. We'll see how we go. But, uh, but thanks for watching. Uh, if you liked the video, please consider liking the video. Uh, if you liked the video and want to see more, please consider subscribing. And leave a comment, show suggestions, uh, anything to do with this episode. It was a bit of a doozy. So any theories, that kind of thing. Try not to make them too spoilery. Probably based on stuff we've already seen. That kind of thing. And yeah, anything else you want to say? <laughs> I'll read it. And yeah, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn off the recording now. All right. Thank you very much. I'll catch you later.